Snake came out onto the road as another armored truck drove up, then skidded to a stop in front of him. The camouflage pattern on the side of the vehicle faded to reveal the words, I have you. Yo, Snake, need a lift? Drebin popped halfway out from the top hatch, can of narc soda in hand. For some reason, the man looked goddamn merry, an honest-to-God jack-in-the-box. Snake climbed atop the APC, pushed Drebin's head back into the vehicle, then lowered himself inside. Drebin said, It's gonna be a bumpy ride. He slammed on the gas, and soon Snake was tossed about the cramped quarters, sandwiched along Drebin's wares and personal belongings. The gibbon, Little Grey, so named because the hairless monkey looked like a little grey alien, hung freely from a metal pipe that ran down the length of the vehicle. I'm following a pure of armament APC. It should still be up ahead on this road. I know that, old snake. Why do you think I came to pick your ass up? Crawling his way back to the front of the vehicle, Snake asked, How did you know? Your partner told me. Otacon? Just five minutes earlier, I'd asked Drebin to support Snake. In no time, we'd settled on fair terms. Drebin was eager to help. Snake regarded the arms dealer. You look like you're enjoying yourself. Aren't you? Drebin urged the APC faster, and Snake was tossed back to the rear of the vehicle like a load of laundry. Little Gray shrieked with glee. Snake's codec chirped. Snake, can you hear me? This is Jack, isn't it? I am Raiden. Jack is no more. The voice was emotionless. Snake slowly shook his head. Something had come over Jack. Was it the very same darkness that had once consumed Big Boss, Liquid, and even Solid Snake? Snake asked, Where have you been all this time? What have you been doing? On a mission. Finding something. For someone. That didn't help clear things up much. Finding what? Something important. Something that holds the fate of the world. A pause. Pandora's box, perhaps. After Raiden saved Sonny from the Patriots, he'd simply said, There's something I have to do, and vanished. Was this what he was talking about? What are you searching for? The corpse of Big Boss. For Snake, time froze. The corpse contained the genetic code of the legendary soldier, the greatest warrior. At Shadow Moses, Liquid demanded it delivered to him. Even after his death, Big Boss continued to hold people under his spell. Jack said, I was asked to do this in exchange for Sunny's location. I was following the only lead I had to find her. Snake, watch out. Liquid wanted Big Boss's corpse before. Could he be the one who sent Raiden to find it? Snake feared it too and ask Jack. Liquid? No. The leader of a small resistance group. She can be trusted. Who is she? Her followers call her Matkapluku. Snake had recognized the words. They were Czech. When he was younger and a member of Special Ops, his training took place in the shadow at the end of the Cold War. Naturally, his studies included Slavic languages. Great Mother. Big Mama, Jack corrected. She seems to have some connection with the Patriots. She said she had plans for you. Snake didn't know anyone called Big Mama, but it seemed like she knew him. It wouldn't be the first time he was contacted by a mysterious person. Snake, Drebin yelled back. I see it. Snake crawled up to the front cabin, somehow navigating the inside of the violently rocking car. The other vehicle was still distant. A clearing far ahead had been converted into a makeshift heliport, probably pure of armaments doing. The PMC's armored truck was parked next to a transport helicopter, and armed personnel stood at the ready. Snake's quarry had already reached their destination. Then Snake saw them. Standing at the open rear hatch of the large transport helicopter, were Naomi and Vamp, that bloodsucker. I yelled over the codec. They're taking Naomi away! Drebin slammed on the gas, and the striker picked up speed, 
a feat only possible because the road had been freshly paved near the heliport. Even with the more level road, Drevin's speed was too great for the ride to be a smooth one, and Snake was again tossed into the back of the vehicle. But as Snake tumbled, he grabbed onto Little Grey to keep himself from hitting the back of the APC. The gibbon, itself barely hanging on, let out a cry of anger and protest to the affront. Snake flipped himself upright, hefted himself up through the top hatch, and found the rooftop gunner's seat. He pulled out the DSR-1 he'd purchased from Drebin and aimed down the sniper rifle's sight, right in the middle of Vamp's forehead. The road straightened and the striker was pointed straight at the target. Maybe the shot would kill the wannabe immortal. Or maybe it wouldn't. But there wasn't time to find a better option. All he could do was shoot. Through the magnified rifle scope, Snake watched Vamp slump to the floor of the helicopter. But he hadn't fired yet. Snake lowered his gun and upped the magnification on the solid eye. The PMC troops hadn't reacted to the sudden collapse of their comrade and likely commander. The rear hatch remained open as the helicopter slowly drifted off the ground. Drebin! Snake shouted down through the open hatch. Faster! Drebin raised his voice over the noise of the engine and the rattling APC. Hey, man, I was just looking out for your senior citizen ass. Hang on tight, old Snake. The G-Force pressed Snake into the back of the gunner's seat, and his body fought against the very last burst of acceleration the striker could muster. His dilapidated arms and back felt as if they were about to snap. The APC crested the last tiny slope before the helipad, and the tires left pavement, the striker practically driving into the compound. Naomi! Snake yelled. Then the world fell apart once more. Just like in the Middle East, the world collapsed onto Snake, and everything descended into chaos. The PMC soldiers on the ground writhed in agony. Only those in the helicopter seemed unaffected, impassably ascending like angels abandoning mankind. He still clutched the sides of the gunner's seat, but how long could he keep that up? He was going to fall. He knew it. Snake looked up at Naomi, who stood still in the back of the helicopter. She pointed a finger at her neck. Even as Snake's consciousness began to crumble, he understood the signal. He took the auto-injector from his pouch, pressed it against his neck, and pushed the button. Then everything came back. The connectors between the neurons in his mind reformed, bringing back meaning, state, essence. He could breathe again. The nausea faded. I'm going for it, Drebin yelled, but Snake couldn't hear from where he sat. It didn't really matter. There was only one way to get the striker to the helicopter. The rear of the APC slid, and the tires left faint tire marks on the helipad as the car drifted to a stop directly beneath the helicopter. Drebin shouted, I have you! Snake called up to Naomi, and she leapt from the open hatch to the APC several yards below. The helicopter had been too high for her to jump to the ground, but the striker's height and Snake's waiting arms allowed her safe landing. She made it inside the vehicle, and Snake followed. Now let's get the hell out of here! Drebin's voice teemed with excitement. This time, Snake grabbed onto the central bar to hold himself in place. It happened again, he said. Like in the Middle East. Naomi nodded. Another of Liquid's tests. The emotional control isn't stable yet. What about Vamp? He injected nanomachines to put himself to sleep and escape the effects. Drebin cut in. Look behind. Snake poked his head back out the top hatch. When I saw them through the solid eye, I thought they were a pack of T-Rexes. When I designed the Metal Gear Rex, I named the machine after the dinosaur, so I could understand the association. But still, I felt silly. I knew better. They were Gecko. That said, the pack of Irving chasing after the striker was straight out of Jurassic Park. I'd heard reports of the Irving's effectiveness, but I didn't know their legs could propel them across the dirt that fast. They were like giant athletes. Snake positioned himself at the mounted machine gun attached to the gunner seat and fired at the gecko. Although the mounted gun shot large caliber rounds, they didn't seem nearly enough to penetrate the thick armor plating of the Irving's heads. Instead, Snake focused his aim on the exposed bits of sensory and nerve equipment at the top of their flat, tank-like heads, on the less heavily armored connections where their weapons were mounted, and on their fleshy, 
organic legs. His strategy proved successful, and the gecko tumbled one by one. But for each he felled, another sprang into its place. I can't believe the numbers of these guys, said Drebin in awe. This is way over the war price here. The war price was a kind of market price that fluctuated according to the demand for PMCs and munition industries, as well as the demand for production, distribution, and energy. As fighting became increasingly intense and prolonged, the war price for these commodities went up. With the prices growing by leaps and bounds, investors had started to take notice. Therefore, with the number of gecko clearly disproportionate to the war price for that region, Liquid's war must not have been motivated by profit. Snake, who was becoming gradually overwhelmed by the swarm, called out to Drebin. The head of the pack edged closer and closer to the striker. Now some readers might be wondering where I was at that moment. I was in a helicopter. When I saw Liquid launch his second test, I flew the combat helicopter out of the Nomad's cargo bay and monitored Snake's mission from there. Factoring in my helicopter's speed and Drebin's, I calculated the fastest possible interception vector. Head for the city, I said to Snake. Drebin spun the wheel and went off the side of the road and onto a side route leading toward a nearby town. One minute, houses began to dot the landscape, and the next, the striker was inside the city. Still piloting my own helicopter, only possible thanks to a liberal usage of the autopilot functions, I sent a map of the city to Snake's solid eye and said, I'm going to land just on the other side of the marketplace. Please, somehow, just make it there. Piloting the APC in a mad dash between the buildings and pedestrians, Drebin drove with a skill inimitable by any ordinary man. Luckily, they'd entered the city through a less populated area. But as they approached the market, crowds became thicker, and this feat became increasingly difficult. Even more unsettling than the striker's swerving maneuvers was how, as the situation became more and more dangerous, Drevin smiled all the bigger. Naomi noticed it too and managed to whisper, You, but had no words to follow. What could she say? Whoa, was all Drevin had to say, his grin nearly as wide as his face. Drebin guided the APC around a corner in a sideways drift to see a flatbed truck block the streets. He flicked the wheel, and the striker rolled on its side and bounced into an acrobatic flip over the flatbed. I expected most everybody goes their whole life without seeing a giant hunk of steel the size of a striker roll through the air, looking like a whale swimming in an aquarium. For all the trouble we caused the fair citizens of that city, at least we gave them a sight to remember. Of course, we couldn't expect the tires to just land back on the ground. And they didn't. The striker landed on its side and slid down the stone pavement with a shower of sparks. Eventually, the friction of metal on stone slowed the vehicle to a stop. Snake had reacted quickly and leapt from the roof of the APC before it left the ground. His knees and hips protested angrily. But that was better than being thrown from the striker. Soon after the vehicle came to a rest on its side, Drebin, Naomi, and Little Grey crawled out. Naomi limped over to Snake. The cries of the gecko, like those of pigs or maybe crazed cows, rang through the skies. Then, moments later, a group of them appeared at a corner Drebin had turned in from. There, inside the city, it was easier to estimate their massive size, just compare one to a building. Three, maybe four stories just barely within the range a person could comprehend, probably a calculated decision to increase their effectiveness. Drebin saw them. Ah, oh, shit. The gecko came at them. One giant step. Another. Then they noticed a man standing in front of them. Some bystander who took too long to run? No, that wouldn't explain how still he was, or the complete lack of fear toward the creatures before him. He was so small in comparison to the giants that Snake's group hadn't realized he was there until now. He wore a black trench coat, and a visor covered his face. But what got Snake's attention was the glowing blade he held in his right hand. Just like Frank's sword. The visor slid up, and steam sprayed out from the sides of his mask. I'd seen those eyes before. The man who killed Solidus. 
Raiden, said Snake. Raiden pointed his sword down to the road as if to say, Run! For a moment, Snake forgot to breathe. I didn't know what had happened to Jack, only that something happened. Something, some terrible thing, had mercilessly torn at his youthful body. In a word, ruin. A dreadful air of desolation radiated from the top of his head to the tips of his toes. I didn't know if Jack, or Raiden, as he had become, had moved beyond whatever events had changed him, or if he was still in the middle of them. Drebin's delighted cry, He made it! cut through the tension. Snake looked at Naomi and asked, Can you move? She took off her heels and said, Yes, let's go. Snake and Naomi left the crash site, but Drebin and Little Grey climbed back into the toppled car. He threw his handkerchief into the air as if part of a magic trick, and the octocamo activated, the striker now a part of the road. The arms dealer and the gibbon were safe inside, where the gecko could no longer see them. Snake, I said. I'm setting the chopper down at the market square. Hurry. Snake and Naomi burst into the market, and its panicking crowds. I landed the helicopter in an open square in front of a church, and kept the rotors turning. Soon I sighted them amid the chaos. I waved them over. Knowing that the pack of gecko would not have the courtesy to wait, I ran through the pre-takeoff procedures. Naomi cut across the grass yard and made it to the helicopter. With her twisted ankle, she was having trouble climbing the waist-high step into the chopper. Snake was behind her, providing cover, and I couldn't leave my place at the controls. Sorry, I said. I'm a little busy right now. I disabled the Mark II stealth camouflage. Naomi noticed the little robot and used it as a stepping stool to successfully make it inside. Snake scooped up the Mark II and got in, and I lifted off. Naomi let off a pinched shriek at the sudden downforce. I turned to make sure they were both all right. Snake was battling some severe fatigue, but otherwise he seemed mostly fine. Naomi had twisted her ankle when the striker rolled over, and I looked at it with concern. That's when I noticed she had been staring at me. Her gaze shot right through me, and I reflexively drew back. But she wasn't staring at me, not exactly. She was staring into my eyes. I didn't have time to protest it. I had to focus my attention on the instrument panel and what was outside the cockpit. I still had a comrade to pick up. Where's Raiden? I asked Snake. He pointed to a street corner. Hang on to something! I pulled the control stick and put the helicopter into a sharp turn. We could get to this point Snake indicated in mere moments. The problem was the pack of gecko that surrounded Raiden. Thankfully, I didn't see any Irving armed with anti-air guns, but attempting to pick Raiden up would bring the helicopter within range of the weapons they did have. Even though the helicopter was built for combat, I wouldn't stand up to a barrage of gecko fire without consequences. All at once, four geckos shot out probe arms that grappled Raiden's limbs. He looked like a medieval prisoner about to be quartered, but he held steadfast against their probes with an inhuman strength. Jack didn't look human, so that's what was underneath his coat. Ruin. Now I apprehended the reason, or one of the reasons, that word had popped into my head when Snake and Raiden were reunited. He looked like Frank Yeager. There were little differences in the details, sure, but I had no doubt. Raiden's body had been augmented by a high-tech exoskeleton. I wonder what Naomi thought as she watched him fight. Was she thinking about how this young man was burdened by the same fate that took her own brother away? Did she still think about it every day? Naomi pointed to the pack of gecko. It's Vamp! A tall figure in a black cloak slinked through the group of machines. He weaved around the gecko and their extended probes with the grace of a ballet dancer. Raiden stood with arms stretched straight out as if inviting crucifixion. With a fierce stare, the Nosferatu said, Yet again our paths cross. Raiden clicked his tongue. I too owed Vamp my revenge, but the bloodsucker had made Raiden live with the guilt of failing to protect his charge. Raiden had been escorting my sister Emma to the computer room at the Big Shell when Vamp ambushed them. 
Raiden wasn't able to stop him from sticking a knife through her stomach. Vamp threw off his coat. He was bare-chested, his very skin the embodiment of a soul born from a boundless cascade of evil begetting evil. A dead man. But my eyes could see that the man was very much alive, not sleeping under the dirt. Powered armor, developed by the army, covered his legs. Vamp pulled a combat knife from its sheath at his crotch and thrust it into Raiden's chest. Raiden! Snake shouted. I brought the helicopter within sniping range, which, given the harsh vibrations inside the vehicle, had to be quite close. I knew it would risk taking gunfire from the gecko, but I didn't see any other option. Vamp made a show of pushing the knife all the way into the handle. When he noticed the white blood seeping from the wound, he looked up and saw Raiden's twisted smile. You too, said the Nosferatu. Immortal. Vamp put his nose up to Raiden's face and took in his scent, or rather, noted the relative absence. Vamp seemed to be thinking, This man is like me. No, said Raiden. I just don't fear death. Vamp snorted. He yanked his knife out of Raiden's chest, then thrust it into the restrained man's stomach. As Raiden coughed up more white blood, Vamp retrieved his knife turned to face Snake in the helicopter and drew his tongue across the blade with a slow, sensual lick. Snake leveled his DSR-1 and fired at the probe arms holding Raiden down. At our distance, the probe arms seemed as thin as strings, but Snake, aged eyes or not, snapped them one by one. With the last probe severed, Raiden drew his sword and kicked into the air. His blade flashed towards Vamp's face, but the immortal was inhumanly fast and blocked the strike with his knife. But Raiden was already making his next move, kicking at Vamp's feet to trip the bloodsucker. Vamp dodged the attack with a graceful backflip, casting out a barrage of throwing knives to cover his retreat. Raiden's sword danced in an attempt to deflect the knives, but several struck his shoulders and sides. Undeterred, he closed in on the backpedaling Nosferatu. But Vamp suddenly moved forward, the maneuver so sudden it seemed to break the laws of physics. In an instant, he was right in Raiden's face. Suddenly, Raiden found his foot pinned to the street. A knife penetrated through the top of his foot and into the ground. Vamp jumped over Raiden's head, flipped into the air, and landed behind him. The Nosferatu wrapped one arm around Raiden's throat and thrust his knife into Raiden's back. He pushed the blade deeper and breathed into Raiden's ear, his breath heavy with pleasure. Raiden's eyes opened wide. Then he took a hold of his sword with both hands, gripped it tight, and shoved it through his own stomach. It's a shish kebab, I thought. Naomi drew her hand to her mouth, a sensible reaction to the nonsensical sight before us. This wasn't a battle, not any more. If I had to call it something, make it mutual destruction. The mutual destruction of two people no longer human, but something beyond. I don't think there were too many of us who could face such a sight. Snake hadn't the option. The surrounding swarm of Gecko required his full attention as he attempted to hold them back with sniper fire. Vamp released a long sigh that hung in the air. He was in ecstasy. Yes. Could you be the one to finally kill me? Raiden pulled his sword free and jumped onto Vamp's back. In a feat impossible for anyone lacking a powered exoskeleton, he sprung in two quick leaps from the ground to the top of a gecko, and from the gecko to our helicopter. Snake reached out the open cabin door and caught Raiden's arm. Artificial blood poured out of the man's wounds and rained white upon the South American city. Snake heaved him up and inside. Are you okay? he asked. Fine, Raiden said but his wounds were clearly severe. Hang in there, said Naomi. Raiden began to cough blood. Even though his blood was artificial, his pale face lost even more color and turned as white as fine china. He wasn't the same kind of immortal as Vamp. Why wouldn't Vamp die? His body hadn't been replaced with synthetics as with Frank or Jack. Vamp's flesh remained that of a man. Tears welled up in my eyes as I faced the disappointment 
of being once again unable to avenge Emma. Vamp, I said. He's gotta be immortal. Then Naomi, tending to Raiden's wounds, said softly, No, he's not immortal at all. I'm the one who made his body like that. Huh? I said. She looked into Raiden's face. Maybe she was trying to see her brother in there somewhere. I'm responsible for Vamp, she said. He's one of my sins. I thought back to the syringe in the Middle East. Before she left it with Snake, she had injected herself with it. Snake asked, Does your body have the same nanomachines? She didn't answer except to say, I brought a monster into this world. And myself too. Raiden began to cough blood again. The spray of liquid, white as pure milk, splashed against the ceiling. The deck was a sea of it. This blood was white and made of plastics. But to his organs, it was the same as the blood in my veins or yours. And if he lost too much, he would die. Although artificial blood taxed the human heart tremendously compared to the natural kind, the amount of oxygen it carried was greater by magnitudes. Even after losing as much as he had, Raiden was probably still all right. But if we couldn't stop the flow, he would soon cross a line from which he would not return. Hold him down, Naomi yelled. I put the helicopter on autopilot and pressed my hands over his wounds. Immediately the slippery white liquid engulfed my hands. This was Raiden's life. Life created by man, different from the red blood inside us. But looking at Snake and Raiden, I couldn't bring myself to celebrate the achievement. The only difference between the curses those two men bore was that Raiden was born normal. Snake came into the world a clone of Big Boss, already bound to the fate in his genes. He's losing too much blood, Naomi said, her hands pressed against the white tide. Beads of nervous sweat formed on her forehead. Can you save him? Snake asked. I don't know. He needs a blood transfusion. No, an infusion of artificial blood. Raiden's coughing fit continued, and the blood kept on pooling under him. If he had still been a normal human, he'd have been dead by now. Then Raiden squeezed the words out of his throat. Snake? Europe? His chin hadn't moved, and it took a moment for us to all realize he had spoken. His mouth overflowed with his own blood, and the white liquid bubbled with each breath. I couldn't believe he had been able to speak at all. Go meet Big Mama. With that, Raiden slipped into unconsciousness. All we could do in the helicopter was press against his wounds. As we gritted against the realization of our